Hi, I'm Patrick and this is the Mach-E Vlog. There's a lot of questions around what Ford is doing to manage their EV transition. There's been plenty of news and announcements over the past couple of years, but if you've missed any of them, you don't have the whole picture. So that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna put it all in like one presentation so that you have a roadmap of what Ford's EV plans look like for the next few years. So let's go. So part of the idea for this video came about because I had this slide up when I did a video about the Ford F-150 Lightning price cuts and sort of just gave like an overview of some of the things that are coming up for Ford. And it, this really, you know, put it all on like one slide, but uh, you know, a few people were like, can you break that down and show us like all of the details? And that's why I decided to make this video. So uh, Ford is investing a lot of money over the next few years. They're talking about a $50 billion investment around the world. They're increasing the lightning run rate, The Mach-E run rate, and if you don't know what run rate is, it's basically, it's like how many vehicles they could produce per year. So of course that's like a flexible number throughout the year. It might go up, might go down, depending on what circumstances are, but run rate is like what they could produce in one year at the current uh, production rate. So a uh, lot of production of the Lightning and the Mach-E coming up. Um, they're looking at a 2 million EV run, run rate by the year 2026. Although in their last uh, earnings call, they said they, they will have some flexibility on that date, so it may come a little bit later than that. Um, there's EV plants online right now. There's a lot of plants coming up. In Europe, they announced the next EV will be the Ford Explorer, which uh, is not the same as a US version. So let's go ahead and move on and we'll start breaking all of this down. Last year, you, you may recall, there was a lot of news around the fact that Jim Farley has split Ford into three divisions. And that is Ford Blue, which is their like traditional uh, ice slash diesel slash whatever, uh, you know, vehicles. The, uh, you know, the, the thing that you think about when you think about Ford, like F-150, the Mustang, you know, all of those uh, traditional vehicles that you've known Ford for years. They also created a division called Ford Pro and that's basically focused on uh, fleet owners and businesses and whatnot, uh, giving them tools that are specific to them as well as vehicles that are specific to them, like the Ford F-150 Lightning Pro is a Ford Pro specific vehicle, although occasionally they'll open it up so that you can order those as a consumer, but uh, that's the goal behind uh, Ford Pro. And then of course, Model E. And Model E is like the big new one in the room. This is a huge change for Ford. And this is where EVs, as well as like some other future technologies that we'll get into will reside. And uh, they, they had a couple of bullet points or four bullet points of like, what is the purpose of Model E? I won't read them over to you, but uh, you know, the first thing is, is like they want a lean, mean like division that's uh, very quickly operating and developing new products and new technologies. And they want to have that separate so that they can attract new talent. Uh, they want to get uh, software engineers from Silicon Valley specifically, uh, people working on user interface and user design, uh, user focused design. Uh, designs. So that's one of their first tenets uh, and reasonings behind creating Model E. They want to sort of move beyond the traditional automotive cycle development where you sort of take a product like say the F-150 and every version after that is slightly modified and different and then even when there's like a new generation it's like based on the old generation with modifications. So they want to uh, do like a clean slate approach to some of their new vehicles and try to think from the ground up like what makes sense. Now there's pros and cons to both ways. Like when you're making like, uh, you know, even generational changes between vehicles, you might have like a lot of common parts that are carried over from one generation to the next. It could be just little simple things like window controls, uh, door controls, maybe transmissions, engines. So some of that stuff uh, will, you know, still take place when you're doing a clean slate design, but the whole idea is like, every time you design like a new generation or a new vehicle, look at it from a clean slate, let's start from scratch. What can we come up with 
break the mold of traditional automotive design and engineering. Next up, they talked about they want to develop in-house the key platforms like for EVs, batteries, motors, inverters, um, and even recycling, talking about battery recycling to sort of like create this more vertically integrated um, system for, for their EVs that they control the design of the motors and the batteries and everything as one platform instead of like outsourcing out, uh, outsourcing out a lot of this stuff. And then finally, they want to create like a software platform fully network vehicles. And this goes back into uh, being able to update vehicles over the air. And the idea, you know, for Ford is like they can get a vehicle out to you and then add features down the road potentially. Or of course, you know, and this is, you know, good and bad about this, but they can create subscription fee uh, features. So it may be Blue Cruise or mapping software or who knows what they're going to come up with. Maybe something in the entertainment realm that you would pay a subscription fee for. A lot of people are resistant to that. Um, Ford has said they're not going to go the way of like charging for heated seats on a subscription basis like some other manufacturers have explored. But the idea might be like if you want Blue Cruise, you can subscribe. If you decide that you don't want that, you can remove that subscription. And if you want it for like a couple of months, you may be able to do that. They haven't like uh, completely confirmed that it'll be like a, you know, available at a monthly subscription. They're talking about yearly. So there's, there's some things that are coming around that with Model E. I'm sure they're exploring a lot of different options, but that's one of the tenets that they, they mentioned in the creation of Model E. Now, the other thing about Model E is that they are sort of using this as an opportunity to sort of reshape their dealer network. Of course, they don't own the dealerships. Those are locally owned businesses, sometimes quite large businesses like Gallup and Ford that we talked about in another video recently. That's a huge, huge uh, uh, dealership down in Southern California. But uh, across the board, you know, Ford has, I believe, about 2,900 dealers. And uh, just under, just around 1,900 of those have signed up to become Model E dealers. And Ford is sort of saying, if you're gonna sign up to do this, uh, first of all, this is what you have to do if you want to sell EVs from Ford in the next few years. If you don't sign up, you can sell Ford Blue products, but you won't get any allocations of the EVs that are coming out from Model E. It's creating a little bit of friction with their, their dealer network, but as you can see, you know, if you get 1,900 out of 2,900, that's a pretty positive step. I'll skip down to that last bullet point. 90% uh, of the U.S. population is within 20 miles of a Model E dealer. So they may not have gotten everyone to, to sign up. And there's a lot of speculation. There isn't actually a full list of who signed up versus who didn't. But it may be some of those more rural locations that decided to opt out because there are some investments that they have to make. And it probably doesn't necessarily make sense for them. Like if you're in a very rural town in North Dakota, for example, it may not make sense right now. They're going to get there at some point, but right now this doesn't make sense because um, the first thing is, is like they're going to require no haggle pricing. And uh, I, I want to get into that a little bit because like when we bought our uh, Mach-E GT Performance Edition that's out in the garage here, we went online, I ordered it, saw what the price is going to be, uh, hit submit on the order, put my $500 deposit down, I fired off an email to the, the dealer just to confirm everything, which didn't necessarily have to do that, but that's the price that you know was on the website. That's the price that was at the dealer. When it came in, I got a notification that it was uh, to be delivered like in a couple of days. It's like, do you want to complete your financing online? I went through that process. So then when I went to go pick it up at the dealer, I literally just had to like sign some paperwork for DMV and then the car was mine. So they're, they're getting close to that already the only little difference is is that dealers still have that ability to like try to tack stuff on when you you know pick the car up and stuff like that so they're trying to like really get dealers into no haggle pricing uh and having consumers or giving consumers an opportunity to order online do the financing online and just pick up the car and i imagine they may even have some delivery options uh coming soon as well so that's, that's like a big change for Ford dealers and they're a little bit resistant to that. They're also, um, you know, 
They're going to require training and equipment for techs. I don't think anybody has an issue. Like you got to have people trained. Uh, if you're selling a car, people, your techs need to be trained on how to fix those. And a lot of the the training is really just about updating computers and, and that type of thing and doing diagnostics, which will apply to Ford Blue as well as uh, Model E cars. The other one that is getting some pushback, I believe, is the, re the requirement to put in DC fast charging. That's very expensive. And uh, there's estimates that it's gonna cost around a million dollars for every dealership to become a Model E dealer. And the huge chunk of that is just putting in a DC fast charger. So I, I could see that there's, there may be some flexibility from Ford. There's still negotiations, although the, you know, the agreement's been signed, but that'll be huge. And they want those fast chargers to be available to the public. So like if I were shopping, you know, down by the mall and there's a Ford dealer across the street, the idea is like I could um, go plug in charge at a Ford dealership. I don't know if I would actually want to do that. I'd rather go to like a, a place that has like 10 stalls versus like a dealer that may only have one. But Ford's making that a requirement. And it's good because not only is it good to have it, you know, publicly facing like that, it's probably good so that like the service center, when they're working on a car before they turn it back over to you after a, like a major repair or something can, can verify that it can level two charge as well as DC fast charge. And as they get more cars that they're working on, you don't want to like have that one level two or however many level two chargers be occupied. Um, if the customers, you know, you finished a car and a customer's going to pick it up in a couple hours, you can throw on a fast charger and the, the car is full and ready for them as soon as they come, come in versus, you know, putting it on a level two charger and it's like, eh, it got like 10% charge. So some positive stuff. I know there's pushback from dealers, but Ford is really pushing on this. They got 1900 uh, of their dealers on board already. I'm sure most of you know about the current Ford EV lineup. I have a lot of bullet points on all of these, but we won't get into it too much, but I uh, just want to touch on some key points of like the Mach-E. That was their first sort of ground up design from scratch EV. It was introduced in November, 2019. That's when we put a, a, an order in ourselves. It was at the LA Auto Show in 2019. They actually went on sale. A few of them actually got sold in December, 2020. It was just like three or four, but they started really trickling out in 2021. It is manufactured in Mexico for North America, Europe, and Australian markets. Uh, there is a Chinese version that's made in China that's specifically just for the Chinese market. The volume there isn't that huge. The, uh, the, U, uh, the North American and European markets, um, they've been selling at 50 to 60,000 per year the first couple of years. Um, they sold 50,000 in 2021, 60,000 in 2022. Uh, but they shut the factory down in the spring and they've now like greatly increased their production capabilities. I believe it was like in May, might have been June, somewhere along there. They, you know, they were making about like 4,000 a month. That bumped up to, ma they made 11,000 Machis in one month. And they have a goal of eventually hitting a 210,000 Machi per year run, run rate. And a lot of that is due to the success of the, the Mach-E. It's run, won tons of awards and very high demand. We ordered our first Mach-E was before it came out. So that doesn't really count. It took months for that to come out, but we traded it up and then traded it in and, and upgraded to a GT. It took us eight months from the day that we ordered it to the day it arrived. That's been greatly reduced now. There's their uh, Ford wants to actually have these on dealer lots so that if you are interested in a Mach-E, just like the old days, you could go in and look and say like, oh, there's a Vapor Blue premium all wheel drive. I wanted Grabber Blue, but they have Vapor Blue. I'll get that one. Or hopefully they have the Grabber Blue that you want or whatever. But it's like they're, they're stocking dealers with more and more Mach-E's. That's created a lot of news headlines because people see that and go, oh my gosh, nobody's buying a Mach-E. Well, they you know, more than double their production. So it makes sense that now there's a lot more Mach-E's. And there is some you know, economic issues with the fact that interest rates are so high right now that it's probably is slowing things down a bit. But uh, here's a, a great photo. Recently, they crossed making 150,000 Mach-E's. This is the 150,000th Mach-E right there with some of the team down in Mexico that actually built that car. 
Another of the current Ford EVs, of course, is the E-Transit. It was announced in November 2020, went on sale uh, very quickly after that. It's manufactured in Kansas City for North America. There is actually a European version that's manufactured in Turkey. They're not selling a ton of these yet. Um, I'm not sure, you know, they, I've heard that they're going to bump it up even more and more. Um, but it won like van of the year by what cars, uh, and that's actually what car with a question mark, but it's, uh, it's done very well, gotten a lot of good reviews and, um, doesn't have the, the, the biggest mileage, but this is sort of, you know, I think a good point about like Ford knowing their market and especially their fleet owners, because I think it has like about 180 miles of range, somewhere around there. And they said like most fleets when they're using their vans are driving less than 100 miles a day. So that provides you even uh, with a buffer that if you are using it like to make local deliveries, you can do that 100 mile loop or whatever and still make it back to the shop and you're, you're completely fine even on a cold day when you're, you have less range or whatever. It goes back to if you're a business owner, um, you don't want excess uh, batteries. If you are somebody like me, it's like I don't drive 300 miles a day, except maybe a couple times a year when I'm doing a road trip, but I want that excess battery because I don't want to have to get a different car to do that. But if you buy like a, a, an e-transit van and you are you know, going to make deliveries with it, you're never going to take that on a road trip. So uh, 180 miles of range or whatever is completely fine for that. And of course, now we move on to the F-150 Lightning. Probably everybody's heard about this. It was unveiled in May 2021. And actually the first delivery was just a year later in May 2022. It's manufactured at the new Rouge Electric Vehicle Center, which of course is at the Rouge plant in Dearborn. Famous, famous factory. If you don't know about it, you should Google it. There's a lot of history behind that. Amazing facility and you can go take a tour of it. Uh, in April 2023, they announced they were starting to export the Lightning to Europe and starting with Norway, uh, and they plan on expanding that to other countries. Of course, they have to go through like safety checks and testing and certification through these different countries, so it may take a little while. It's won tons of awards, including Truck of the Year from Motor Trend and Knack Toy, which is a North American Car Truck of the Year award that's sort of like a... It's basically like, a, I think, 60 different journalists come together and give out that award. They are also increasing the production of the F-150 Lightning. It went from 40,000 to 80,000, and then now they're looking at hitting 150,000, potentially even more, at that Rouge Electric Vehicle Center. And it's basically, a lot of it was uh, reconfiguring, expanding that facility, and also getting the batteries and stuff that's needed to make that many lightnings but it's really cool to see that they're ramping up the production of that and getting more and more out the door um, they have gone through a lot of the pre-orders and now it's like very easy for you to go and order and a couple of months later get a lightning so a lot of the the things where people were saying like i tried to order a lightning i couldn't get one i went to the dealer and they had like a ten thousand dollar markup don't have to worry about that anymore you can pretty much go order one and you'll have it in a couple of months. So a lot has changed with the Lightning and it's super successful. And here are some photos of the Rouge Electric Vehicle Center, F-150 Lightning's coming down the production line. And you can tell it's like, it's actually on these like robotic platforms. So it's like, you can tell like it's a very modern facility and it's right next to like where they make the F-150 regular. And you can take a tour of the regular uh, Lightning, a uh, regular F-150 production facility, but here are some photos of inside the Lightning facility. Um, huge difference. And then there we go, we're talking about the, the ramping, and this is so, sort of showing uh, what Ford has projected as their ramp. Of course, you know, these numbers aren't probably exactly specific, but you can see it just like shoots up like a hockey stick toward the end, which is really great to see. And then we'll get into this in a little bit later, but, um, and really don't have many details about any of these feature products, but there has been talk about there's gonna be a 2025 Ford Explorer for the US market. This is different than the European one. Uh, also in 2025, there's T3, Project T3, which is Trust the Truck as Ford calls it. 
Um, weird name, it won't have that name. They're, they're sort of billing it as the second generation of the F-150 Lightning. And it's gonna be vastly different than what the current Lightning is. They're designing this from the ground up. It's gonna be look different and be different than any other truck Ford has ever built. And this is why they're sort of saying trust the truck because a lot of people I think are, you know, when they're doing things with this new truck are, are saying like, I'm not sure we've never done it like this. And it's like, trust the truck. Like uh, the project that they're working on is gonna be different, but if they trust what they're doing and the goals and the mission of making it efficient and usable and good for a, you know, a work truck, they're gonna be fine. That's what consumers really want. Um, I, I imagine it's gonna look quite a bit different there's been some people that have tried to do some like CGI of like what the the light the the new T3 might look like, um, but I don't think Ford has like let anybody in on the secret. I can't wait to see what it looks like. There's also some new commercial vehicle that's going to be coming. Um, that's all I could find on this, and uh, except where it's going to be manufactured, and we'll get to that in a bit. But there is at least that coming. As far as other vehicles for North America, I haven't, I couldn't track down any specifics. Ford is, you know, as you could see in the previous slides, they're pretty good about, um, even with the Mach-E, they announced it in November uh, 2019 and December 2020, the first customers had it. So just over a year, and that was during COVID. And then the same thing with the Lightning, it was one year later, they were able to get deliveries to customers. So Ford generally doesn't say like, here's a product that's four years out, three years out or something like that. They're usually getting pretty close when they are, uh, you know, sort of making their product announcements. So maybe we'll start seeing some stuff because we're getting closer to the end of 2023. So when you're saying like things are gonna be in production in 2025 or they're gonna be a 2025 model year, that means they sort of, we're getting to that time period where um, maybe at the end of this year, beginning of 2024, we should start seeing some more concrete plans. Going back to Europe, there's a lot of stuff coming in Europe. Um, you can see here in this slide, uh, there's the Mustang Mach-E. The Lightning e isn't even listed on here. This was before the, the Lightning was announced that it's going over to Europe, but they also have a bunch of other stuff. So there's um, the ones basically from the Mach-E over um, you can, you know, between the Mach-E and the E-Transit, those are all like delivery type vans and van vehicles. So um, there's gonna be a lot of like, I think they're sort of like almost like one vehicle that will be, have, you know, variations. Um, but looking at the silhouettes, they look a bit different size. So it's gonna be interesting to see what they do with that. I don't wanna to speculate too much when Ford is just showing a shadow. It's like, that's all we really have is the, the little shadow. They also uh, show the medium-sized crossover and the sport crossover. We can basically safely assume the medium-sized crossover is the new Ford Explorer that has since been unveiled in Europe. There's also a Puma, which I think is exciting. It's a smaller vehicle. I wish we would get that in the US. They haven't eliminated the idea that it would come to the US. I just don't think it's a, a priority for Ford, unfortunately, but I would love to see like a Ford Puma over here, an electric version, that would be fantastic. So let's get into some, you know, how is Ford gonna make all of this happen? And it's gonna take a lot of retooling of current factories and building new factories. So the, the, the most famous one or the biggest announcement that Ford has been talking about is Blue Oval City. It's like their largest factory that they've built in decades, I believe. I forget how you know historical it is, but it's huge. It's, uh, a facility that's jointly announced by SK and Ford. SK is a big South Korean battery manufacturer, and it was announced in September 2021. It's gonna be built in Western Tennessee, Stanton specifically. They're putting 5.6 billion in it together between the two companies. It's on 3,600 acres, so it's huge. And we know that there's gonna be some other stuff besides just the Blue Oval City from Ford and SK. Um, some of it is still like connected to Ford. They're going to work with a local community college to build like a, a technical training facility there. Um, and that's something that Ford is doing with several of these uh, facilities and this, uh, factories is they're putting in training facilities as well. They're spending, I believe, over 400 million over the next few years on training for uh, EVs. 
and it could be everything from like you know how to build batteries to servicing EVs. So there's a lot of stuff that Ford is doing on the training side. Um, but also on this this campus, Magna just announced they're going to spend over seven hundred million dollars uh, to build a facility that is basically to supply the rest of the Blue Oval City. So. Uh, and if you don't know Magna, you can go check out uh, some videos uh, on them. Just Google it. I know Kyle Connor with Out of Spec did a, a tour of Magna in Germany, I believe, and sort of gives a real good behind the scenes. And there's some, there's already some connections between Magna and Ford, as there are with uh, Magna and a lot of manufacturers. But one on the Mach E that I want to mention is on the GT, the black grill. It's sort of like a 3D effect, but it's actually a 2D surface, and that was created by Magna. So pretty cool, but they also do like lots of transmission stuff, um, electrical work. They do just so many things. So it's very cool to see that they're involved. Uh, I also saw that there was going to be a Lowe's specifically at Blue Oval City for the, the rest of the um, businesses that are going in there. So pretty interesting sort of cooperative um, giant facility, like a city that they're building there. It's going to employ 6,000 people, and I believe that's really just like the Blue Oval City from Ford and SK. I don't think that's including like Magna and like some of the other people that are going to be going in, like Lowe's that I already mentioned. And it should be operational in 2025, and it's going to be the Blue Oval SK portion is going to be a vehicle assembly plant, um, and they're going to be able to output about 500,000 vehicles per year. Uh, battery plant, battery recycling, and as I mentioned, a training center. And the battery plant will be able to produce about 43 gigawatt hours annually. So that's a pretty decent chunk. We're going to get into some other battery facilities in a little bit. And here's a slide basically just sort of reiterating some of the things. And this is out by Ford. But the, uh, the, the size of the campus, as I mentioned, includes the Ford SK part, but also the on-site supplier part, which is pretty interesting. Here are some construction photos. They broke ground. They're already like quickly underway, moving a lot of dirt. There's a lot of stats if you go and Google that about like how much dirt they've moved and how many rocks they've brought in. And uh, you can see the buildings are going up already and they are on track to open in 2025. And you can see here, here's like a, a, like a 3D rendering showing the complex with a lot of solar panels on top. And that goes also back into Ford is trying to make this a very environmentally friendly facility. It's gonna be heated by geothermal using ground heat to heat the facility. They're gonna to try to use zero uh, water in the production of the vehicles. Um, I'm, I believe that's because they're gonna collect the water on site. Basically some lofty goals, but they're trying to make it very low carbon footprint facility type thing and, and just good for the environment overall. Next up is the Blue Over SK Battery Park. This one is in Kentucky. This was also announced in 2021. It was actually in September 2021. It's going to be built or it's actually being built in Glendale, Kentucky. This is a $5.8 billion facility and they are expecting to employ about 5,000 people when this is built out. It is smaller than Blue Oval City down in Tennessee, and that's mostly because this is just batteries. It's not like multifunction. They're not gonna have a supplier park and all of that. They also want this operational in 2025, and it's gonna technically be dual plants, each of them producing 43 gigawatt hours per year. So a total of 86 gigawatt hours out of the Blue Oval SK battery park. So you can see that the numbers of gigawatt hours are starting to add up that Ford is gonna be bringing online in 2025. And here are some photos of the construction that's underway in Kentucky. They're getting uh, some great progress out of that. They just tweeted, I believe a day ago, that they are uh, still on track for 2025 for becoming operational. Uh, next up, we'll talk about Blue Oval Battery Park in Michigan. This one is just announced a few months ago in February of 2023. This one is not in partnership with SK, but in partnership with CATL, a Chinese company, which created a little bit of friction for some people. I don't know how you feel about that. It's like, a, it's better than having Ford making stuff in China, but having the Chinese factories here creates some friction, like I said. This is going to produce uh, LFP batteries. If 
you don't know, LFP is uh, the newer battery chemistry that's going to be in the Mach-E any day now. They're, they've already started manufacturing these down in Mexico. So uh, it's lithium iron phosphate batteries. There's some differences. It's not quite as energy dense as the current batteries in the Mach-E and Lightning, but it has some other advantages. It has uh, it's sort of like a, an easier battery to deal with because you can run it from zero to 100%, 100% back down to zero with no issues. So you can have a daily max charge of 100% won't affect it. So uh, there's some advantages to that as well as Ford is thinking that this is going to be the cheapest LFP battery that you can get made in the U.S. because they're sort of, you know, eliminating some of the stuff of like going, sending stuff to China to be processed and then bringing it back. They're going to bring it here, assemble everything, do everything here. They think they're going to have one of the cheapest batteries um, available when this thing comes online. It's going to be near Marshall, Michigan. I don't even know where that's at. I just know it's in Michigan. I should look that up. Uh, they're spending $3.5 billion on that. It'll have about 2,500 employees. And uh, this is expected to come online in 2026. So a little bit later than the other battery facilities that we've talked about and uh, that's going to have 42 gigawatt hours and again you start adding it up we're getting quite a bit of gigawatt hours out of ford the other thing that they mentioned was it's going to be a, a single cell but they'll use it in multiple products so I, I imagine that you know the lfp battery might be used in you know maybe a future explorer and mach e and lightning it'd be a versatile product coming out of that that factory and here you can see the, the NCM cells on the left that is currently in the Mach-E versus the LFP cells on the right. Um, one's more of a pouch. The other is like, almost looks like the traditional batteries that uh, you've probably seen in previous years, you know, like the, uh, the old 12 volt batteries that you would get to power certain things. But that's a Mach-E battery pack that has the new LFP batteries in it. And if, you, if I looked at that before, I would think that was an extended range battery because that hump, that's sort of toward the rear of the battery pack. Well, this is a standard range LFP Mach-E battery, but because it's less energy uh, dense, they need that extra space to just, you know, basically are using more space to create the same like energy output that the uh, NCM batteries produce for the Mach-E. So it takes up a little bit more space, but should be a cheap a bit cheaper and they've actually mentioned that like coming out with the new lfp mach e's for the standard range will be cheaper for customers over in europe ford has uh com started converting the uh, cologne electric vehicle center or the cologne plant it's now going to be the call the ford cologne electric vehicle center it's about a two billion dollar investment it's on a really small footprint it's only 309 acres they should be able to make up to uh, 250,000 vehicles per year out of this. It will include a production line for vehicles as well as battery assembly. And this is where the European Ford Explorer is going to be made starting the end of 2023. And then by next year, there will also be the sports crossover EV, whatever that is. So excited to see what it looks like and um, all the specs behind that. And here are some renderings of like the, what the transition will look like. Um, I'm sure they're pretty close to being done. They're going to start manufacture later this year. Um, in fact, I believe they already have some uh, explorers going down the assembly line. I don't think this is a computer generated image, but here's an explorer on the assembly line. And then that's what the Ford Explorer coming out of that factory is going to look like. It is interesting to note, uh, if you don't know, this is built on VW's MEB platform. So it's sort of, um, they, the motors and the batteries, the, basically the platform that this is built on is provided by VW and Ford is doing all the other engineering work, hopefully better software than VW. No offense if you have a ID4. Next up, we'll talk about the Oakville electric vehicle plant in Ontario, Canada. They are going to start retooling this factory in Q2 of 2024. And they're going to do it quickly. They're going to get it back up and running and want to be in production of late 2024. The rumor is, again, uh, Ford hasn't really said what's coming. They don't generally do that type of thing. But it's going to be a next-gen EV is all that Ford has said. A lot of people are speculating that it's going to be the, the U.S. version of the Ford Explorer. 
They're putting uh, 1.8 billion Canadian into this and it's on 487 acres. Ford has uh, basically like the reason that they wanted this facility is like it's, um, they own the land. There's already a skilled workforce there. They should be able to get them back up and running very quickly and it'll save them two years versus building a factory from scratch. Cause you can see like they're gonna retool that in just a few months next year, apparently. And it'll start producing vehicles next year. Whereas Blue Oval City, they're building from scratch. It's a multi-year project. So it's excellent to see this uh, timeline that they're talking about for the Oakville electric vehicle complex. Uh, some of the details about it that are key, 3,000 employees, 5.4 million square feet, 487 acres. But you can see right now it's building the Ford Edge and Lincoln Nautilus, uh, and it has a long history of producing other Ford uh, vehicles throughout the years. And I think this is one of the awesome things that Ford is doing is they're sort of retooling facilities, reusing the, the facilities they have, as well as keep keeping those employees that are currently working there, giving them opportunities to make this EV transition as well. And this is sort of a model of what the facility will look like once it's been reconfigured, retooled. Another facility back in Europe, this one is by Ford, LG, and Coach, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, uh, holding in Turkey. It's gonna be uh, near Ankara, Turkey. It's gonna have a, it's another battery uh, facility. It's gonna produce 25 gigawatt hours per year. Apparently that's expandable to 45 gigawatt hours and production is gonna start in 2026. Didn't find a ton of information about this one other than like the announcement, but uh, I imagine a lot of those batteries will be used for European um, uh, vehicles that Ford is producing. So maybe that, that crossover, the Puma, who knows. Hopping back over to the US, the Ford Ohio assembly plant. And this is where it comes in. It, the only thing I saw said an all new electric commercial vehicle is gonna be made here. Um, it's gonna be in Avon Lake, just west of Cleveland. They're investing 1.5 billion here. There's gonna be 1,800 jobs, 419 acre uh, job site. I didn't see any you know, firm dates of when this is coming online um, as well. So they're, they're working on this. I'm just not sure, but it's, again, it's like Ford is just creating sort of a portfolio of factories and facilities to do batteries and vehicle assembly to support their EV transition. And just a few days ago, uh, Ford announced another plant related to all this. It's the Ford Quebec cathode plant. And basically they're gonna be uh, producing nickel cobalt mag uh, manganese, sorry. That's gonna be used in some of their other batteries. I'm imagining down in Blue Oval City and it's a, a partnership with EcoPro, BM, SK On, which is of course SK and Ford. They're gonna uh, begin production in 2026. It's a 280,000 square foot facility, 345 new jobs. It seems low, but that's what was in the sort of like press announcement. And again, this one is fairly new, just announced in the last few days. Um, but this comes back into Ford is trying to bring as much onshore as they can into North America. So they're trying to not only do like battery assembly, but processing of some of the materials here in the US. And this is because of the tax credits. So uh, there was a lot of controversy about the like $7,500 uh, EV tax credit. And it created a lot of pressure on manufacturers because they lost the tax credits for their purchasers, for the owners, because they're bringing in stuff from China or from other countries. And now um, we're sort of seeing the fruits of that, that legislation. Ford and others are bringing stuff here in North America so that we're creating jobs closer to home. So it's a great thing to create some of those uh, high paying green jobs that we've all talked about. And um, you know, sometimes we sort of don't like seeing regulation being the way that it's done, but here it looks like it's being effective. And here are some photos, some renderings of what this will look like. And they've already broken ground on it, even though it was just announced recently. So they must have had this in uh, the planning stages for quite a bit longer. I also wanted to mention some of the personnel hires that Ford has made. I think some of these are, are key. There's some really big names here if you follow the automotive industry and the tech industry. Some are you may not know uh, as well as others. And if you don't follow tech, you may not know any of them. But uh, there, there's a few that I wanted to mention and I'll work my way 
up from the bottom. Peter Stern, um, he's one of the most recent hires. He came in from Apple. He's responsible for like rolling out Apple TV Plus, Fitness Plus, some of their like consumer cloud computing uh, platforms and services. So um, it's it's sort of interesting. I think this comes back to that the pros and cons. I think Ford is going down the road of having subscription services and trying to create value for customers that they're willing to pay for on a monthly basis. So if you hate that type of thing, you probably don't like Peter Stern, but he's the, the man that Ford brought over to do that for them. Probably some of the same stuff that he's done at Apple. Uh, no concrete you know, plans or words on what Ford is actually doing with, you know, with the, any of these subscription things other than it's been mentioned Blue Cruise is gonna be a subscription service. But anyways, uh, those are the type of things that he's an expert at doing. And if we're gonna go down that road, uh, at least I hope that somebody like Peter Stern can make sure that it's bringing value to me and something that I'm willing to pay for. And if I am in paying for it, that I'm getting my updates regularly and that it's you know providing good value. Sammy Omari, he was uh, involved in Hyundai's Motional. Um, he's now head of Ford's ADAS and uh, Latitude AI. When they say AI slash ADAS, this is all the, the driver's assistant stuff. So Blue Cruise and beyond. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that later. Uh, Jay Park, he came over from Amazon and Google. He has a lot of experience with digital product design and basically trying to make that good interface between the technology assistants and uh, platforms that we have in our house and making them more consumer friendly and uh, better interactions with those. So he's been brought in to sort of help with that. And the last two I wanna to mention together, Alan Clark and Doug Field. Uh, Alan Clark's gonna be working directly under Doug Field. These are two huge hires, um, Doug Field, worked for, uh, he actually started with Ford, uh, worked on with Segway for a little bit, went to Tesla, was working with Tesla. Uh, then he also um, worked for Apple. And you might go like uh, Tesla and Apple, that's a interesting combo. Well, if you ever followed any of the rumors, Apple was rumored to be working on their own car or at least their own car uh, technology system. Nobody really knows. Apple never came out with like a final product, but apparently the, the rumor was is Doug Field was leading that effort of investigating that for Apple. Even though it didn't go anywhere, he has a lot of experience with Tesla as an engineer there, as well as Apple, and then for Ford to be able to bring him over, that was that's huge, it's, it's really great. So he has a lot of experience um, at senior levels in Tesla uh, as they've rolled out products over the years as well as Alan Clark. And Alan Clark comes from Tesla. He was involved in uh, numerous things. I believe Doug Field, like one of his big claims to fame is rolling out the Model 3. Alan Clark has been there for years and has been involved in the Model S and X, I believe in their refreshes. Um, a lot of different things along the way. I believe he's also even involved in some of the Cybertruck engineering. So sort of a, you know, some people like the headlines were labeled as Ford pulls a coup in bringing these people over from Tesla slash Apple. And I think it's huge to see the direction that Ford is going in. And like, if you, you like put two plus two together, if you're saying like, we're gonna take some of the, the best aspects of Tesla, we're gonna merge that with some of the uh, best aspects from Apple. And then we're gonna add in the experience that Ford has of manufacturing vehicles for 120 years. And I think you have a really good combo there. So. All of these hires, I think, are going to have key roles, and it's really exciting, the talent that they're bringing in. And if you remember one of the first slides, I mentioned that Model E, one of the, the tenets of that is that they're going to be able to bring in talent. So this is sort of like the proof is in the pudding. They're bringing in this key talent. Now they have to produce some products to back that up. And I said I was going to mention ADAS, Blue Cruise, um, all of that good stuff uh, in a minute. So we'll just talk briefly about that because EVs, technically have nothing to do with any of the ADAS and uh, Blue Cruise or any of that stuff, but people, it sort of like goes hand in hand. And part of that is because Tesla goes hand in hand with autopilot and full self-driving beta. So when people talk about EVs, they sort of also like, they always ask like, you know, can it drive itself? That type of thing. Um, Ford has been doing, in my opinion, a great job. Blue Cruise is, was ranked by Consumer Reports as having the top rated active driving assistance system. 
Um, it's gotten a lot of other awards. Kyle Connor has ranked it very high. I believe it's the number three spot up there with Mercedes at number one. Tesla full self-driving is number two. Um, so it's, it's up there. And, and I find it to be a, a great product for what it is. It does like lane change assist. Uh, it does in-lane repositioning. It's getting better and better. New features are coming out. A lot of people just got an email today that uh, they will be getting version 1.3 very soon. We just had a meeting with Jim Farley a couple of weeks ago where he mentioned he was working on a, or dry, testing out a beta version that was even better. So really excited by where they're going with this. Um, but that's hands-off driver's assistance, which is sort of rare. So Mercedes offers that. Ford offers that, GM with Super Cruise offers that. Tesla doesn't have any hands-off systems currently, although there's rumors that they may be going hands-off with some of their systems in the very short, you know, very near future. But Ford systems is good, it's, it's right up there. And they are also, they created a new subdivision called Latitude. Latitude is a new division from Ford that is wholly owned by Ford. They're focused on driver's assistance features and they are the sort of the, the remnants or part of the remnants of Argo AI, which is a jointly funded venture by Ford, uh, VW, and uh, Lyft. And it sort of like all fell apart for different reasons, but Ford hired a huge portion of the Argo engineers and now created Latitude. So it's focused on driver's assistance features and taking it to the next level. One of the things that Ford has done is they've shifted away from like going for true level five 100% completely autonomous uh, self-driving features. And what they are looking at is like the level three, level four. So a little bit of a step down, but their whole idea is like, we don't, you know, it's really hard to solve that last bit. And the, it doesn't pay off right now to invest the amount of time, energy, and money into that. And that most people will be satisfied with something that will handle most situations. And uh, one of the things they want to go for is doing some hands-off, eyes-off, basically level three under certain conditions. So it may be like when you're on the freeway with certain speed limit requirements or whatever, that you can go completely hands-off and eyes-off and do other things and the car will let you know when you need to take back over. Very early days for Latitude, but it just sort of goes to show a lot of people were um, commenting recently because Elon Musk said he was uh, in, uh, early had early uh conversations with a major manufacturer about licensing fsd beta and everybody was immediately assumed ford i don't think it's ford partially because like blue cruise is doing great for them uh the other reason is is because of this latitude ai that they just created and then the other thing is is like i think any manufacturer that would do that takes a complete reconfiguration of their car because they're going to have to like put in a much more powerful computer and way more sensors if they want to easily translate FSD beta over to their car. So long story short, this is where Ford is going with some of their ADAS technology. And before I finish up, I wanted to touch on some things that Ford mentioned at their Capital Markets Day 2023 back in May. Just some things that I thought were some highlights. I've covered a lot of them and used a couple of their slides already uh, previously in this, this presentation, but I want to hit on a couple of things I thought were really interesting. Uh, first of all, the number of new customers to Ford from uh, outside of Ford. So 50% of Lightning owners are new to Ford. 60% of Mach-E owners are new to Ford. Those are fantastic numbers. They're getting new customers that have never bought a Ford before. So that's, those are fantastic to see. And especially for the Lightning, it's also getting 60% of their customers have never been in the full size truck segment. So I think it's like opening people's eyes to the possibility of like not always doing like an SUV or something like that. Um, even us, like we have no need for uh, an F-150 Lightning, although I did own a F-150 many years ago, but just the capabilities of it, especially with the pro power on board and being able to send power back into the grid or to the house, um, it's fantastic to see the capabilities of this truck it makes me want one, even though I don't need one. So that's why we don't have one. And another another slide that they threw up, I thought this is really interesting. And this goes back into like how Ford and Model E and the dealerships and how they want people to be able to order cars. So even with um, you know doing like online ordering, the big disadvantage of that is like even with Tesla, with as many vehicles as they're producing, 
people will order a car and it could take several months for them to get the car. And you know, for many people, that's fine. Uh, Tesla keeps very, very few cars in inventory. So you may find like, if you need a car, you can go down there and go like, I need a, a Model Y right now and I want it to be long range, but it may not be the color you want or whatever. And, and right now Tesla has not a ton of different uh, models uh, variation. They have, you know, four models or whatever. Uh, and then slight variations within them. So what I thought was interesting about this is it sounds like what Ford wants to do is like they're going to have retail replenishment centers. So maybe like major distribution centers for um, cars in your area. So like maybe down here in Southern California, maybe there's one in San Diego and one in LA, or maybe there's one Southern California. So if I want like this car here, a Cyber Orange uh, GT Performance Edition Mach-E, uh, and I go to my dealer, I'm like, I, th this is a car I want. Or if I go online and order it, it may say like, it's it's not at your local dealer, but there, it is at the replenishment center and we'll have it there, you know, after a few days of shipping time. Um, and maybe if we're further away, so like maybe the distribution centers, um, like we live in Las Vegas and they don't have a distribution center. Maybe it's like, yeah, it is in Southern California. It'll take a few days to get it to you. So I think that's actually huge. And if you think about it, it's sort of like combining the best of having a dealership network and the best of having online ordering because online ordering, you can order exactly what you want and you can get it. But if you have two, three, four months delays, that isn't great for you as a consumer, especially like, you know, your car gets into an accident and you're like, I got to get a car and I need it now. Well, you don't want to wait two or three months, but if you have a, a replenishment center that can get that to your local dealer within 10 days, we'll say two weeks, maybe that's 10 business days, who knows? But that's a fantastic improvement and an advantage of having the online ordering combined with dealers, combined with the replenishment center. So one slide, but I think it was, has, has huge implications. And then, as I said uh, earlier, 90% of the US lives within 20 miles of a Model E dealer. They had a map sort of highlighting some of that. Tons of dealers throughout the U.S., even in some of those uh, North Dakota, South Dakota areas that I mentioned that maybe they don't want to sign up for Model E, but maybe they have. Um, and then, of course, starting to add everything up, it looks like Ford has secured a total of 240 gigawatt hours of battery production. That's a huge number. Um, it's going to probably have to grow even larger as we go deeper and deeper. So... Um, but if you look at all the different battery facilities that I talked about, you can see it's like it's building blocks. They're going to take 42 kilowatts here or gigawatt hours here plus 42 gigawatt hours there. It adds up and they have some tremendous capacity coming online in the next few years. And that's huge. Without batteries, you can't make an EV. And it looks like Ford has thought about that. And although, you know, although those announcements aren't as sexy as like a new vehicle, these are even more critical is to get these battery facilities online. And then the final thing, and I didn't want to make this at all really about stock price or financial advice or anything like that, but I do want to touch base on the fact that like Ford has talked about losing uh, two to three billion dollars in 2023 on EVs, AKA Model E. And a lot of people, depending on you know who was looking at it, but a lot of people were like, oh my God, they're losing so much money. They're losing so much money per Mach-E, per Lightning. How can they ever survive? Well, first of all, the, you know, Ford is looking at this as like, we're looking at it for the long haul. So they know that, you know, yes, the Mach-E and the Lightning currently are expensive to, to, to build. Um, they also know they have to invest in a lot of uh, capacity to come up with. So they're spending a ton of money and rightfully so. So in 2022, um, this uh, markets uh, day was referencing mostly 2022 data, but they had a 40.6% negative um, EBIT and that's earnings before interest and taxes, common financial term. Um, Google it if you don't know it. So anyways, they're, they're, they're losing like 40%. And how are they going to get to their goal of 8% by 2026? And they sort of broke it down. A lot of it is going up in scale. In other words, producing more vehicles. The more vehicles they produce, they can reduce cost of manufacturing. They've, 
they can get better efficiencies in getting materials. So they uh, are, are saying they will get about a 20% or 20 points there just by increasing the scale. 10% uh, is due to the battery, sort of like bringing some of that with the vertical integration and bringing that in-house, bringing on their own uh, manufacturing facilities. If you're not buying it from somebody else, but you're making it, you'll save some money there. So they, 10 points there. 15% is down to design and engineering. And so one of the things that uh, Jim Farley has talked about recently was the, the fact that like when he wants to update like a, a, a seat function on a Mach-E or something in Blue Cruise, he has to like, they have their system that they can modify, but then it has to control these different modules that aren't made by Ford. So they literally have to, cause they don't own the intellectual property. So they have to contact the supplier and get authorization to make the change. And oftentimes the, the supplier wants to verify the changes are not gonna break their product. So they have to go through their own testing and then Ford has to go through the testing once it's been integrated in their system. So it's very complex. So by Ford, uh, you know, coming up with their own designs, engineering things better, bringing stuff in house, they'll be able to save some costs there. They also uh, are very clear about that building EVs is different. There will be new, better uh, manufacturing processes that they will be able to achieve at the Blue Oval City. So, you know, no one knows exactly what they're gonna do, but it, if you saw the lightning plant, you see like things are more automated. They're gonna have better efficiencies as they learn, as they grow, as they scale. So that's another 15 points. Three points for other, if you add all that up, their goal is 8% uh, EBIT margin by 2026. And they went into a lot more detail. If you want, you can Google um, Ford uh, Capital Markets Day. They have all of this information online. There's a huge presentation where I got these slides that you can like download and dive into it as well. But overall, I just wanted to you know put all this together. I know it was very long. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of exciting things out there. But here it is all in one place. If you uh, take that plus um, you know like the enthusiasm that we're seeing from Doug Field and Jim Farley, we just had a meeting a couple of weeks ago. We'll have a separate video out on that if we don't have it out already. Um, if you don't know, Jim Farley is a car guy, first and foremost, and he loves his V8s and whatever, but he is also truly excited by EVs and was doing a Ford F-150 Lightning road trip. He's excited by what the EV community is going to bring, um, but he also understands all of these struggles and what it's going to take to get Ford there. And he, you can sense his enthusiasm for this transition and for making this work for Ford. And it was controversial splitting uh, Model E off, um, but I think it was the right decision. One of the, the the downsides to splitting Model E off is you get to see exactly what's happening with their EV business. So whether it's VW or GM or whoever, a lot of the other legacy manufacturers, they sort of break out their profits and losses by like region. So it's really hard to tell, like they lost this much in this region and then this region over here has a different reporting period. They lost this much for on EVs as well, but you got to sort of like add it up and try to mix it all up and see how much they actually lost. Ford understands that this is their biggest transition ever. This is the auto industry's biggest transition ever. And they're doing what they can to prepare for it, but they're also being transparent about it. And like they're losing money. They're losing a lot of money this year on it, but they're making the investments in manufacturing facilities, they're making the investments in technology and driver's assistance technology, they're making the investments in uh, hiring key employees, they're bringing in people from Silicon Valley, getting them all involved, merging that. Um, and I, I'm excited, uh, we, we don't have any like tied allegiance to Ford, but I do hope them the best and very excited by what's coming out. I can't wait to see what the T3 is going to be supposedly vastly different. And, you know, wish them the best of luck. Um, and that goes the same for Ford and uh, Chrysler, under, you know, Dodge, all under Stellantis. But all of our, you know, U.S. manufacturers, I hope they survive this transition. I think every time you go through these big cycles for any manufacturer, um, when it's going from like, you know, one generation to the next of like the Mustang or the F-150, they're always 
huge and difficult and they risk losing their, uh, their position when that happens. Well, now we're talking about changing the entire lineup of Ford. It's gonna be very risky, um, but they have to do it. And I think they had the building blocks in place to get this done and only time will tell if they're successful or not. Um, you can you know, look up all of the, the interviews that Jim Farley has done. I believe he's on the right page and um, that's, that's about it. So anyways, hopefully you guys liked all of this. If you want more of this type of in-depth um, dive on what Ford is doing, I can go even deeper into some of this. I can try to get some interviews with Ford to explain a lot more of this stuff in detail. I would love to go take a look at Blue Oval City um, before it comes online and after it comes online. We've got a couple of years for that to, to take place. But if I'm ever on the East Coast or near Tennessee or Kentucky, I will definitely swing by and take a look at those facilities um, just because I think it's fascinating. And uh, if you are work for Ford and you got insights, please reach out to me. I would love to go take a look at any of this stuff that's, that's taking place, including uh, Latitude AI. You guys haven't said much about that, but I'm interested in that. Let me know what you guys are interested in and uh, drop a comment down below, drop your questions down below. I'll try to get to all of those like we always do. Uh, I want to thank our patrons. Uh, those are the people that are committed to two, four, or $6 a month. We try to like mention them in every video, but we also try to like give them some behind the scenes stuff early release to uh, some videos, that type of thing. If you want to join, the link is down below as well if you want to join. Um, we have some people that have been with us at the $6 level for the past two years. So thank you so much for all of those. Maybe we should do an anniversary shout out. What do you guys think about that? Anyways, I should go and just want to say, as Liv would say, uh, whatever you drive, whether it's now or in the future, hopefully it's an EV. If not, maybe we'll get there as well. That was pretty lame. She would be disappointed in me. But anyways, enjoy the drive. Oh. <laughs> She's laughing at me. I said, enjoy the drive, not ride. Come over here and say hi and bye. It's very cute to watch. Hi. She's finishing her I work. I think you did well enough, right? What do we think? Give him a thumbs up. I'm going to hit stop on my watch. Bye. Fine. Bye. <laughs>